I've been understandably very distracted by the crisis in Gaza, the attempted ethnic cleansing being carried out by the government of Israel in Gaza. And that has distracted me from producing videos. Uh, instead, I've spent a lot of time producing tweets. I saw a tweet by a guy called David Badiel. I'm not quite sure who he is. And the tweet said, the overuse of the phrase wrong side of history continues on here and elsewhere, despite the obvious evidence in front of our eyes that history is in no sense an unstoppable arc towards greater moral progress. Now, that seems to be from a conservative standpoint, that there isn't any, any such thing as progress. And he doesn't, obviously, my impression is that he may be sympathetic to Israel on this. And my reply tweet to this was, there is no doubt that the four centuries or so of Euro-American world domination are drawing to an end. And from the standpoint of most of humanity, that is progress indeed. So that raises the question, what do we mean by progress? Why is progress possible? So let's take this example, which is thrown into sharp relief by the struggle against the last vestige of Euro-colonialism in Asia, the um, battles going on in Gaza now. Why was Europe able to rise to world domination? Why were European states able to conquer vast territories and either subdue or kill off the native populations of these territories? And what was it that happened in the second half of the 20th century that brought an end to this? And finally, let's look at why did Jewish colonialism survive into the 21st century and will it continue surviving? Now, if we ask why was Europe able to conquer and colonize parts of Africa and conquer other areas of the world, the basic answer is simple. It's nothing to do with racial superiority of the Europeans. It's due to the fact that capitalist economy developed in Europe before it developed in the rest of the world. Europe had steelworks, steamships, mass production, breech-loading rifles in the 19th century at a time when African ironworks were basically artisanal production of iron. These are traditional iron furnaces in Gabon of the type that would have been used in the ironworks in Africa in the 19th century and at the same time we have a picture of a typical steelworks that would be in Europe or America at that time using blast furnaces, much larger scale, capable of producing high quality steel. From high quality steel you get high quality weapons. Africa and Asia had artisanal iron working. At best they had wooden sailing vessels. Uh, they had hand production and muzzle loading rifles. These are two guns of the same period, late 19th century. Top one a Nigerian produced one, bottom one a British Empire one. And it's not difficult to see why an army equipped with the second would defeat armies equipped with the first. Now, why did all this come to an end? Well, the establishment of colonialism itself led to the creation of capitalist economies in the dominated territories. And with capitalist economies came the classes characteristic of capitalism, working classes and national bourgeoisies. And from these, you got the rise of independence movements. Uh, the Soviet Revolution occurred and that gave aid to the independence movements. As a deliberate strategy, the Soviet Union consistently supported 
revolutions in the colonial and semi-colonial countries. You then had the development of the strategy of protracted people's war in China and Vietnam, which provided a military strategy by which the colonial powers could be defeated. And then, finally, you had the availability of mass-produced Soviet and Chinese weapons, which the liberation movements could make use of and removed the technological superiority the European imperialist powers had. And there was then a 40-year period of defeat of colonialism in Africa and East Asia. Starting out in 1954, you had the defeat of the French colonial armies by General Giap at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Two years later, you had the failure of the Franco-British invasion of Egypt. Um, Inter-imperialist rivalry was a factor here. Uh, the US wanted to end the British and French colonial empires, so the US acted to stop them. Four years later, de Gaulle was forced into negotiations with the Algerian independence movement, effectively conceding um, defeat in the war with the National Liberation Front, and by 1962, Algeria was independent. In the same year, 1960, the British Prime Minister Macmillan went to Ghana and made what's known as the Wind of Change speech, in which he effectively conceded the end of the British colonial empire in Africa. And by the mid-60s, all the African colonies except Rhodesia were independent. From 1961 to 1974, there was a protracted guerrilla war in the African colonies of Portugal, which ended up with the victory of the National Liberation Fronts and a revolution in Portugal which overthrew fascism. In '75, you saw the fall of Saigon and the final victory of the Vietnamese liberation, National Liberation Movement. A few years later, at the Battle of Quito Carnivale, the South African army was defeated by the Cuban army when the South African army was intervening on the side of puppet regime um, of the US. That defeat of the colonial army led to the crisis of apartheid. Nine, two years later, Mandela is released and apartheid itself ends three years later. So. That's a 40-year process of great success for the national liberation movements. Now let's look at where did settler states succeed and where did they fail? Well, basically, the settler states that succeeded are the ones I've shown in um, greeny yellow here. US, Argentina, Uruguay, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Basically, Australasia greater part of North America and the southern cone of South America. And the failed settler states, which are significant, were General Plan Ost, the plan that Germany had to set up a colonial empire in what's now Belarusia, um, Ukraine, Western Russia. Korea, which was a Japanese settler colony. Algeria, which the French were thrown out of, as I said. Then Kenya, Rhodesia, South Africa were all British settler colonies in Africa. And Angola and Namibia were... Um, sorry, Angola and Mo Mozambique, I should have said, um, were Portuguese settler colonies. Namibia was a failed, originally a failed German settler colony. So, the coloured areas are correct. I missed out Mozambique from my list. What made the difference here? Why did some succeed and some fail? Well, to succeed, settler colonialism required a large historical stage gap. Basically, the gap that was required was between capitalism 
and pre-Iron Age societies. Pre-Iron Age. That meant there was a correspondingly big technological advantage and a correspondingly great advantage in terms of social organization and state structure. Finally, you had a big demographic advantage for the settlers versus the native population who were heavily outnumbered because in the 19th century Europe was going through a demographic boom. It was possible to mobilize huge numbers, millions upon millions of European settlers to, to move to these lands. And without all these factors, attempts failed. Obviously, if you take General Plan Ost, it failed because there was no technological gap. It was an attempt by capitalist society to conquer a more advanced form of society, and that failed. But the attempts in Africa failed because the societies weren't that backward. They were Iron Age state societies that they were occupying. Now, what about Jewish settler colonialism? Is there a, a large historical stage gap between the Jewish settlers and the Arabs? No, it's a very small gap. It's capitalism versus agrarian peasant economy, which is at most one stage. Technological advantage? There's a moderate technological military advantage that was quite evident in the 1950s or 60s, but is becoming much more, much smaller. Even in 1973, the technological advantage of the settler state was shown to be minimal compared to Egypt. And demographic advantage? Well, that's a marginal advantage again, only maintainable by constant ethnic cleansing and immigration, the encouragement of immigration. The whole policy of the settler colonial state centers around these two themes. And the crisis that's taking place now is around ethnic cleansing to try and ensure that the settlers have a, a clear demographic advantage. Now, there are historical analogies to the current situation. We know that external aid from the USSR, Cuba, China, etc. was critical to 20th century decolonization. And also, the pressure from the rising great economy, the USA, was exerted against Britain and France. And this was because, possible because of the fact at that point, Britain and France were heavily in debt to the USA, which was the world's dominant manufacturing power. Now, if we look at the current situation, Iran and possibly Turkey may play a similar role to Cuba against Israel that Cuba played against South Africa. And we have the pressure of the rising great economy, China, which will be exerted against the uh, USA, who are again in a similar debtor position. And finally, the technological military advantage of the USA is declining in the face of China, Iran, in a similar way to the way that Franco-British technology and military advantage was declining relative to USSR in the 50s. The USSR had missile technology, which Britain and France didn't have in 1956, and could realistically threaten to hit London and Paris. Iran and China are gaining a similar lead. Now let's reflect on this. What does it say about progress? What does it say about what progress means? Now, David Badiel said there's no right side of history. Well, we've looked at historical process, one which lasted for the latter half of the 20th century. And it was a historical process 
with a clear set, clear direction. Colonialism retreated, national independence advanced. So the phrase right side of history had a real meaning. People who defended the Pied Noir in Algérie Française in 1958, the US in Vietnam in 1967, the apartheid government in 1976, all of them were proven to be on the wrong side of history. There can be no doubt of that now. So the question is, why does history have a direction? Why was it not just a random process with some colonial empires falling whilst others were being established? Why was it not a cyclical process of empires just rising and falling? In fact, the basic question is, why is there a historical arrow of time? And that is a basic assumption of historical materialism, that there is a historical arrow of time. Well, what was Marx's answer? He, summarizing in a few words, uh, well, it, I've shortened a passage. At a certain stage in the development of material, productive forces of society come into conflict with existing production relations. From forms of development the productive, of the productive forces, these relations turn into fetters. Then begins the era of social revolution. This is absolutely the key concept of Marx's theory of history. Does this apply to decolonization? I think it does. If we look at in the 19th and 20th century, in, in the 19th century, in 1860, Britain and France were world leaders in technology, both military, industrial, etc. They had coal-fired, coal-powered economies which were vastly more productive than the areas they conquered. This was a difference in productive forces in the most literal sense. They were able to harness the energy of coal where the other parts of the world weren't. By 1960, the lead of Britain and France was gone. The old, the oil-fired economy of the US had become dominant with its vast Texas and Californian oil reserves. The USSR had industrialized and rivaled Britain and France in, in key industries. And the colonies themselves were now beginning to develop the productive forces of capitalism and the class relations which went with them. So yes, the change in world productive forces was what undermined the basis of European imperialism. Now, if we look at the 21st century, we see that the collective West, Europe and America, or U Europe and its settler colony offshoots, are declining relative to Asia. And... I would predict that in the course of the 21st century, they'll also decline relative to a rapidly industrialising Africa. China, India, Japan, South Korea and Indonesia currently produce 44% of world industrial output, manufacturing output. So the growth of Asian industry is the material precondition for the decline in Western power and the crisis of Western power that we're seeing and the crisis in Israel is overdetermined by the crisis of Western power. Carthage is in ruin. States, economically advanced states, can fail. We know that the economically advanced civilization of the ancient world declined. So there's still the question of why do productive forces develop? Why don't they just go backwards as often as forwards? Why is there any direction to it? And this raises the broader question 
the related question, why does biological evolution, for example, have a direction? Well, all of that's for another video.